him, who had to stay this far away because of common sense, customs, traditions, the laws of scripture, and even the laws of the land. What made him who had to stay away so he didn't infect anyone else? What made him go through the crowd to get to Jesus? Faith. Not just some kind of empty faith in faith or some other philosophical trust in some strange things, but faith rooted and grounded and directed squarely at Jesus. And that means not just the man that had been there up on top of the mount speaking to the people and so forth, but it means also then his teachings, his word. For his word is who he is. And faith in Christ and what Jesus had just said led the leper to seek him out. For Jesus had just preached, Blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who is poor except a leper? Jesus preached, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, preaching greater than what Moses that he had come to fulfill the law, even, yes, Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, which dealt with leprosy. He had heard Jesus preach things that are greater than the things of Moses. He had heard Jesus preach about asking God for even earthly blessings. Ask, seek, knock, and so forth. That even earthly afflictions were matters of prayer. The Christian. It is always fitting in the Holy Scriptures that where Jesus teaches, then Jesus confirms his teaching by doing a sign, a miracle, as to what authority he had. That this is the authority that the crowds marvel at right before today's text in Matthew 8. They marvel that he is one who teaches with authority. Authority unlike that of the scribes or Pharisees. And he had a greater authority. And that no one else ever spoke like Jesus spoke. And that no one ever confirmed their words with works like Jesus did. The leper leaves aside all of the curse and the struggles and the suffering and the, and, and the being put aside isolation of his situation, he leaves it all aside to embrace the words of Jesus. And then the works of Jesus will then become evident as well. Braving the crowd's cries of unclean, and who knows what else. After all, if someone came to the doors this morning, while we were in here, and they were visibly sick, with something that was horribly contagious. How would we respond? This man's faith in what Jesus had said drew him to Jesus. And his faith was in the word of Jesus and in who Jesus is. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The cry that he had heard throughout his life since getting leprosy, the cry of the world all around him would have been the word unclean. His prayer, Lord, if you are willing, make me clean. That this is not just empty words, but the text tells us they were accompanied by actions. He goes up to Jesus. It says, he knelt down before him. But really it says, he bowed down, he put his face in the dirt in worship to Jesus in front of him. But these are works matching his words. Seeking of Jesus as true God. Calling him Lord. And saying not something like, well, if, if God is willing, could you ask him for me, Jesus? But instead, vesting all power, all authority, and all willingness in Jesus as God. If you are willing, he says. 
And then he confesses his power over something that is normally not healed. You are able to make me clean. And his faith in the words and the person of Christ. Faith which confesses its trust in both word and in deed. In prayer and in petition to God himself for help. Jesus confirms everything he says. Instead of scolding the man who is now bowed in front of him in worship to him, instead of saying, get up, he receives his worship. He receives his adoration because Jesus is true God. He receives the address of Lord, a word in this context which can only mean confession of divinity. That he's God. He receives the petition about his power to do this and his willingness to do so. He even does something the world never does. He reaches out and touches the leper. He does not respond like that faithless king of Israel we heard about in the Old Testament lesson. He doesn't tear his clothes and decry, Am I God to do this? Jesus is God, and he's going to do it. He had taught them. And the leper's faith had grabbed onto Jesus by his words, and Jesus lets it all happen. He's willing to listen to his prayers, his requests. He's able to help, and he says, I will be clean. The crowds had yelled unclean. But Jesus had said, you put yourself into that place? You should be able to. The world has all kinds of things to say about you, I'm sure. The Bible does too. In fact, your flesh, your conscience may also add to their chorus their own voices. Sometimes those voices might outright condemn you. Sometimes those voices might utter all sorts of evil against you. Maybe sometimes those voices might be the self-confidence voice of deception or pride. But faith in Christ trusts a different word. The word of Christ. He had preached. The leper had held it sacred and glad to hear, heard, and learned it. The leper let his faith in Jesus as true God show in his words and his work. And such faith, worked by God himself through the word, was mighty to ask Jesus for help. A different word than what the world, the devil, and the sinful nature had given. A word with the power to actually change things. I will be clean. The various voices in your life may utter all sorts of things against you. Sometimes they might be even nice to you, but most times they are probably not that nice. But the only word that matters, however, in this life is the word of Christ about you. And because of what he has said and what he has done for you, because his words and his works are always tied together, you know his words are words of cleansing. They are words of forgiveness. They are words of salvation, of grace, and of mercy, and so forth. Even when his word goes out and it convicts you of your sin, it is meant to draw you into the confession of that sin. So that you could hear the forgiveness of that sin. But these are his words, and his works always confirm them. And the greatest work which confirms them is the work of the cross. That by his innocent suffering and death, that this is his work so that you can have life. That he takes on the dirt and the shame and the unclean, so that you can be free and pure and whole. Such is his work for you that he not only did all of that back then, but he also makes sure then that his word gets to you now the same forgiveness and power to make sure that your faith in him is fed and nourished. But he baptized you. And that water, he washed you clean. And that water, his word for you was, you are mine. I will be clean. The world may say, no way done too much. 
trial. This one's mine, he said. Your conscience may accuse you along with the devil, but this one's unclean. Look at all these sins, all the stuff that you've done, all the stuff that's been done to you, unclean. Christ speaks a different word, a word that flows out from his own bloody work of atoning for the unclean so that they can be fully clean and pure. His word is a word of forgiveness. Be clean. That's his will. It's God. What he says goes. So also the example of the centurion shows us that Jesus is true God. What a wonderful gift is that is faith in Jesus. That Jesus marvels at the faith of this Gentile centurion. He also rebukes the faithlessness of Israel. That a Gentile here believes better than anyone in Israel. Luke's Gospel account of this tells us that this Gentile centurion was very generous to the people of Israel. And he helped to build a synagogue for them and did all kinds of good for them. So in Luke's account, these leaders of the Jews come with this centurion and they speak well of him. They say, he is worthy to be listened to. Jesus, you should help him because this is a good man. He's done so much for us. But here in Matthew's account, we see what faith does. We see the faith at work in the centurion. Because the centurion doesn't say, Jesus, you need to answer me because I've done so much good stuff. I am so worthy. You need to help me. Now we see him confess, I am unworthy Faith in Christ does not claim special worthiness by works. Now, the works that we have as Christians are the fruit of faith, and they bring with them their own rewards, certainly. But they do not make us worthy. The centurion believes in the power of Jesus' word. And he has this love, this care for someone under his authority in his household, a servant. He prays for this servant who is suffering terribly. He has a compassion on someone of a much lower estate than him. He has compassion on someone that probably the rest of the world might think, who cares for such a lowly person? The centurion confesses that Jesus don't need to come to heal him. And there had already been, he had learned this, there had already been a man from Capernaum whose son had been healed from being near death. And by Jesus saying, your son will live, that that boy lived. Without Jesus being present, but being far down the road. You can read about that more in John 4. But the centurion here would have heard that. Because the word of that miracle would have spread all around. And then by the word of that miracle, this centurion knew and trusted. On the basis of his trust in Christ, that Christ himself could do whatever needed to be done, even from a distance. Now, this is meant to be a great comfort to us. <coughs> How often, when we are afflicted, or when people around us are afflicted, loved ones who are suffering, how often do we feel like Jesus is so far away? But seriously, when life is bad, when times are hard, when suffering sets in, when we're watching other people suffer, it seems like Jesus is nowhere to be found. It seems like Jesus doesn't hear doesn't care. But of course, we know by faith that he is closer than we want to admit in these cases of both sickness and healing. That he himself is Lord over both. But even so, let this example of the great faith of the centurion, faith in the power of Jesus to do great and miraculous things from afar, 
Let this move you to pray to him, knowing full well what he wills and what he is able to do. Even from what seems to be such a long way. Jesus commends and models that he commends this great faith of the Gentiles in truth. He doesn't tell him to go do the laws of Moses or to cease being a Gentile. He doesn't even tell him to quit the military. He commends the faith of this Gentile. And so through both miracles of Matthew 8 today, one for a Jewish leper who no one regarded, and one for a Gentile, whom everyone regarded. He shows that he, Christ, is for all. And that everyone who believes in him has all the blessedness of Christ at their disposal. He teaches about heaven and about hell, that heaven will be for the faithful, and hell will be for those who are unfaithful, do not believe. He sadly remarks for how many sons of the kingdom those who hold to the religion of the works, most evident by those Jews who rejected him and his gracious visitation, how they will be in a place of weeping and gnashing. He tells about the faith of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It relates to the same as the faith of the centurion. Faith in Jesus as Savior. Faith in Jesus as true God and true man come to save humanity. All of it. Faith in Jesus being the one offspring <coughs> promised to Abraham through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He says, people will come from east and west. From all over and all times, Jesus says, people will come and recline at the table in the kingdom of heaven, along with these patriarchs, these men who believe the same things from long ago. And the setting he describes is one of feast and celebration Believers. No matter what state they found themselves in in this life, from socially outcast lovers to affluent Gentiles, the believer is blessed at the table of Christ. This is language that relates to you right now. That a table is set for you, for you to recline at and receive the blessings of Christ for you to. That your faith grabs onto this just as the leper grabbed onto the Sermon on the Mount and the centurion had come to understand who Christ was and what he could do by his word. And Christ says it beautifully in his last verse, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. Words that are a part of the right of individual or private confession, if you've ever been blessed to hear them by partaking of such through this Christ blesses you with absolution. He blesses you. He makes you sit at table and rejoice with his gracious teaching about his divinity and the great and gracious gift of faith in him. But with great blessing at the table where he himself is served with his body and blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins, for your eternal life, and for your eternal salvation. world's words are all too often words of uncleanness. But Christ's word is a word that brings a cleansing. That his will is for you, his children, to be clean. The world's thoughts of worthiness are wrong. But the one who has faith in Jesus is worthy already. Christ Jesus sees the faithful as worthy because of his own word and his own work for them. And as the only one with that kind of authority, he has willed for you to be washed, to be absolved, to be fed into cleanliness and worthiness, so that you, along with all believers, will enter the kingdom of heaven and recline at his table in an eternal feast all those who have ever come before us and that by the street of the church are still our 
brothers and sisters.